Good morning. So good to see all of you smiling faces looking back at me this morning. Um, I'm going to, uh, I don't normally do this. I don't like to do this normally. Um, but I'm going to pick up where Kevin left off. And um, the reason I don't ever do that or don't like to do that is um, we have different kind of styles of doing things and ways of doing things. And I don't like to try to step into where he's been or uh, come behind him and pick up where he's left off and that kind of stuff. I just, I don't ever feel comfortable doing it. But when he called me and asked me to fill in this week, he mentioned uh, where he was going to be. And I could tell he kind of wanting me to be there. And I said, ah, I said, I don't normally come in, you know, where you've been. He said, yeah, but he said, this is different. He said, just look at it. He said, you don't have to. I'm not going to tell you what to preach. Never have. I ain't going to do that. But I want you to look at it. Just look at look at it and see what you think and see if it's something you'd be comfortable preaching. So I looked at it and, and really and truly um, enjoyed the study and enjoyed um, going over it and over it again and again. Um, so that's what I'm going to do this morning is pick up where Kevin left off. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Um, again, not going to have the time to pick it apart and go verse by verse through these last couple the way um, he had done the first couple. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in verse 10. Don't stand up just yet. Um, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. And we're going to be talking about the secret to contentment in all things. The secret to contentment in all things. And the reason we think this is so important, important it's always important. Um, it's in God's Word. That's what makes it important. But the reason it seems to be so important right now if you look around um, and we be honest, we are as a whole, as a society, as a church, as people in general, we are in today's times the opposite of content. We want more, right? Give me more. I want the newest, the latest, the greatest. I want to have the most. I need more. We all want more. Let me have more hours at whatever cost. I need more hours because that means more money and that means more stuff. And that is the society that we live in. It's where we live. It's We live in a time that is opposite of content. Opposite. Give me the greatest vehicle, the newest vehicle, the newest motorcycle, more shop tools, more woodworking this, more paint this, more guns, bigger house, whatever. And we'll sacrifice everything we have to gain it, right? We'll sacrifice family time for more overtime. We'll sacrifice going to church for more overtime. I know I'm not going to get to amens this morning because it's too personal. I get it. But listen, just because you don't agree, don't make me wrong. Okay? Just because you don't agree don't mean I'm wrong. See, what tells me where we live and what we believe and how we feel is how we live our lives. All these things I've mentioned, you've done, I've done, we've done. We do it, don't we? We sacrifice everything for more. Give me more. We'll quit our job that is right here at the house paying enough to get by on, to travel six hours to get to work because it paid $5 an hour more. We'll do that. We live opposite of content. There's coming a time when being a Christian may cost you everything. In other words, the job you have today that pays so good because you're a Christian, you may have to make a decision and go, I'm either going to give up Christianity and keep my job or I'm going to have to go to McDonald's and flip burgers and still be a Christian. And if you don't know how to live content with any situation, I know what you'll choose. So do you. scary it's scary the times we're in is scary we're going to see things if things don't change pretty quickly 
at 43 years old, I'm going to see things in my lifetime that I could never have even imagined in this country. Now, people in other parts of the world have already experienced it. And some of them are shouting at the top of their lungs, Wake up, America! You don't want that! And we're going, I'd like to try that. Give me some of that. Let us have some of that. Let's try that. Let's test that. It'll be different because we're America. And we point our chest out. They've not done it like we've done it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've done it. And it failed. And it'll fail here and it'll cost us. And we'll look up one day and we'll be living in a situation where we're going to have to make a decision. Life as we know it or Christianity. And the scary thing is the most of us will take life as we know it because we don't know how to be content. According to Paul and what we're fixing to read, Christ is enough. Just Christ. Nothing else tied to it, nothing else to go with it, not even a place to lay your head at night. And I know that makes you cringe when I say that. I know it does me too. But the truth of the matter is, Paul didn't give a rip what the circumstance was. In his mind, no matter what he was facing, Christ was enough. We're going to read this morning that there's a secret to that. He says it. We're going to learn that that's not natural behavior for human beings to be content. It's a learned behavior. So that means it's going to take effort out of you and I to learn what it's like. And I'm telling you, you may think I'm crazy, but we better learn it because I think it's going to be necessary for us to learn to be content no matter the circumstances. Because this lack of contentment that we have right now is destroying us as Christians. It's destroying the church. It's destroying our country. Because they can dangle anything they want to in front of us, and if it's bigger or more than what we have, we're going after it. Throw caution to the wind and go get more. So let's go to... Philippians chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse 10. Now remember uh, remember our context and where we're at and what we've been talking about and what Brother Kevin's been preaching and doing an awesome job with, by the way, in uh, preaching to us from the book of Philippians and going over this letter and talking about his love for the church and his concern for the church and his desire for unity in the church and all these things. Because this is still the same letter. And although mine and your version today has chapter 4, verse 1, we can go all the way down to 10, this was a continuous letter that Paul wrote in letter form to a church. It didn't have verses and it didn't have chapters. That's been added so you and I can better understand it, but sometimes that stuff breaks it up to the point that we forget that this is one continuous letter. Every word of it was on I'll say paper, we know it wasn't on paper, but was on the paper and delivered by hand. It wasn't broken up. So all of this is it's relevant that you keep your mind focused on what's been going on up to this point because we're at the end of the letter now. So in order to understand fully the end of the letter, you've got to keep in mind that it is a letter and there's more to it in front of it. So if you haven't been here for the weeks leading up to this, I encourage you to get online and look at those messages or just go home and take your Bible and sit down and read it. Not for the goal of getting finished with it, but for gaining knowledge. And, and, and go through this and understand this letter. And what we're fixing to read will make a little more sense if you have been here. If not, it's not, it's not so detached that you're not going to get it, but it, it'll all be in context. And I'll show you the importance of that this morning again. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, 
No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again, once and again. Now that I seek the gift, but I seek, not now, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Edward Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father and our God, we do come to you this morning again to say thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together this morning. I thank you for your word and, and what it has spoken to us this morning. Father, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to your word and your word only. That you would remove my ideas, my opinions, Father, that what is heard this morning would be your ideas and your opinions. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask you to be with those that are not able to be here with us this morning, whatever the reasoning is. We pray for a healing where healing is due, Father. We, we, we pray for courage, Father, for those that are facing things that, that strike us with fear. Father, we pray for your guidance and your direction throughout our services this morning. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what I've gathered from reading this, the Philippians are concerned for Paul's well-being. They have been a supporter of his ministry since it began. And they, at one time, were his only support. Now, this uh, Epaphroditus cat is bringing some kind of gift to Paul. And Paul is appreciative of the gift, but at the same time he has some other things that he wants to make sure that he gets across to this Philippian church. If you'll read through Acts where Paul starts his, gets his conversion, he's on his road, Damascus Road, and he's going to, to uh, persecute Christians. He's got papers in hand and permission from everybody to do that. And he has an encounter with Christ and he goes from Saul to Paul and, and his conversion to Christianity, and you'll follow him through Acts and through his missionary journeys. And then after you complete that read, if you'll go back and, and go through the books that Paul wrote and you'll look at the things he writes, you can tie where he's at in his missionary journey when he writes to a particular church, and you can see him personally visit some of these churches. You can see these churches begin to be established while Paul is there. Philippians is one of those churches that you can go and find where Paul first went there and you'll find where you find the story of Lydia. Remember he goes into this place. The first place he would go when he went somewhere was to the synagogue. He, everywhere he went, the first place he went was go teach in a synagogue. In this particular place, when he gets there, there's no synagogue. The, the Jews, the converted Jews are, are meeting down at the river. And there's a lady by the name of Lydia. Y'all remember Lydia, the seller of fine? That's her. That's this church. That's this church. Now, this Paul gets with Lydia. He meets up with her at the river, and this church is born from that encounter. So if you read through this and read it in context, you can see this big story unfold of this great man Paul and this adventure that he went on to spread the gospel. And what you'll find as you read it is Paul never changes. From the time he becomes Paul, his vigor and his fire that he had against Christians becomes for the gospel and he never changes. The first thing he does everywhere he goes is preach the gospel. The last thing he's doing everywhere he goes is preach the gospel. It don't matter if he's in jail. It don't matter if he's been beaten in the streets and drug outside the city and left for dead, when he gets back on his feet, you know what he does? He believes everything he says, and you can see that in the way that Paul lives, his, not because he wrote it down, 
Not because he said it, because you can see it play out in the way he lives his life. This thing about contentment, we're going to talk about this morning. I could take you to several places throughout Scripture in the New Testament and show you examples of this being true, not because Paul said it, because we can look at him living it out. We can see the things that he encounters. And we can see that his MO never changes. It's always the same. The most important thing to Paul is the gospel. Over and over and over again. And you can see that for yourself if you'll just get the Bible out and start reading. And again, you can start in Acts and read about his conversion and you can read about his missionary journey and all the places he goes and you read about these stories. Then you go to where he's wrote these letters because what happened is he went through these places, established these churches, and then down the road he would write letters back to them. Hey, that's our Bible today. Must have been some important stuff in Paul's letters, right? God chose to put it in His Word. So this morning we're looking at a place where Paul is talking to the church at Philippi, the Philippian church, a church that has supported him. Hey, they was, according to what we just read, they were some of the first folks to support Paul in his missionary journey and his spreading of the gospel. And they continue to do that and they seek out ways to support Paul. And at this time they're trying to send him this, or they have sent him this gift and he's written a letter back to them in response. And right here where, where we're starting at in verse 10 it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me but you had no opportunity. Paul goes, I know. He says you have revived your concern. In other words, I've received something from you again. Not that you ever your concern ever went away. Not that you quit being concerned for me. But now you've had opportunity. And look what he does. Because he, remember, this is a letter to the church. This can get twisted and turned so easily. In verse 11 he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul goes, man, I appreciate your gift. I received your gift. I was encouraged and I rejoice because your concern for me has been revived. Not that you quit being concerned for me, but you didn't have opportunity. But now that I've received this gift, I need to let you know I'm not telling you I'm in need. I'm not speaking of being in need because I have learned if you're taking notes this morning, the first step to being content is personal experience. You've got to understand that contentment is not born into you. Paul says, I have learned to be content. And look, in every situation, it don't matter if I'm on my deathbed. It don't matter if I've been drug out of the streets and left for dead. It don't matter if I'm shipwrecked. It don't matter if I'm snake bit. Huh? It don't matter. And listen to me. I don't believe Paul believed this because he said it. I believe Paul believed this because I seen him do it. Read his read this. Look at these situations. Listen, you can go into Corinthians and see that Paul had what he referred to as a thorn in his flesh. And he begged God to remove it. Now we can't really say what that thorn was. I think it was somebody. Because I've had some of them myself. <laughs> that wasn't nice. He has this thorn in his flesh. And, and, and whatever that thorn was, he asked God to remove it. And God said, no, I'm not going to remove it. And I put that there for a reason. So that when you're weak, you can see that I'm strong. So Paul had this, this, this thorn that he had to continue to minister. He didn't look at God and shake his fist and go, but I want you to remove it. It ain't fair. He was content with it, right? He was content that the fact that it was there made him stronger in Christ. So many times when things don't go our way, you know what we do? We get mad at God. We shake our fist at God. We get on our face and go, why me, God? Why? I've done so much for you. God's going, 
You know why we do that? We don't know how to be content. It's not natural to you. You've got to learn it. Even Paul had to learn it. He said right there, I have learned. So the first thing about contentment is it's not natural to you. You've got to learn it. It's a learned behavior. That's my second first thing. I know. It's learned. And Paul said, I have learned. He said, I'm not telling you I'm in need because I have learned that no matter the situation, he's going to get even deeper into that part. Just keep going with me. I'm not speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul says he's learned that God expects him to be content, right? Look at verse 12. Here's where I was trying to get to a while ago when I jumped my notes. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. Personal experience is actually number two. I called it number one earlier. Number one is you got to understand that it's learned. Number two is personal experience. In other words, we get into some things sometimes and we look at God and go, why am I, I mean, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be here. And the whole time God's got you in the place where He's trying to teach you something. He's trying to let you experience something. You know, I learned a long time ago that God don't give me nothing that's just for me. Everything He's given me is to be shared. He didn't give me forgiveness so I can wad it up and put it in my pocket and walk around with a pocket full of forgiveness. He gave it to me so I can offer it to other people. He didn't give me grace so I can walk around with a pocket full of grace. He gave me grace so I can offer that to other people. Listen, the bad things are the same. He didn't give me the things I've experienced in my life just for me. He didn't give us miscarriages just so we could walk around and say we've had miscarriages. He allowed me to go through that so I could learn something. And I figured that out at church one night on a Wednesday night. I was doing a Wednesday night service at a, at a different church that I pastored. Um, it was the second one. And the name of it was New Hope Baptist Church over in... Uh, off of Rabbit Trail Road, I was teaching on a, on a Wednesday night. I was teaching. I was standing up at the pulpit teaching. And I looked up and this lady come in the back door and she was obviously broken. I'm talking about squalling. And she came in the door and she went into the nursery. It, it was set up where you came in the door and the nursery was on this side and a pastor study or restrooms or something was on this side and then she came into the sanctuary and I could see plumb to the front door from the pulpit and she went into the nursery and she was all by herself. She was a, a, a younger lady and she was squalling. And I, I seen it and I, I was the only one that seen her come in so I just stopped what I was doing. I told everybody I'm sorry but something has come up and I'm going to have to quit. We were just a few minutes from being done anyway but I, I've got something I've got to address. Y'all pray and, and I'll be... Busy when y'all get done praying, so you know don't hang around looking for me. And I grabbed Amanda, and she and I went back into that room with that lady. And I walked in there, and I said, "Ma'am, I, I couldn't help but notice you came in broken. What, what can we do for you?" And she said, "I don't even know why I'm here." I said, "Okay. <laughs> so what's going on?" She said, I, "I just left the doctor's office, where they told me I've had a miscarriage." And I was going home, and I got to this stop sign down here, and I either turned right to go home or I turned left to come here. And she said, I got up here to this church, and I just pulled into the parking lot, and I've been sitting in the parking lot, and I felt like I needed to come in. And I said, ma'am, I know why you're here. I ain't going to stand here and tell you I know how you feel, but I'm going to tell you this, we've been where you are. And I can tell you that nothing in this world is bigger than God. And we had the opportunity to minister to this woman that night from experiences we had been through. Now, I'm not standing up here telling you I want God to make me suffer so I can minister better, but I'm standing up here telling you that sometimes we suffer so we can. it's learned. It comes from personal experience. Can that person be ministered to even though you've never been where they are? Sure they can. And can God do that? Sure, and He does it all the time. 
But do you know how much more impactful it is when you can tell somebody I've stood where you stand? What about you yourself when you're in those hard times? How many of you want to take parental advice from a person that don't have kids? Just one example. I know, I've done it for years. <laughs> Up till about five years ago, I'd done that all. I gave out all kinds of parental advice, and they'd look at me and shake their head and walk out and go, he ain't even got kids. How's he know? I've noticed that people listen a little more now that I've been in this. <coughs> right? Sometimes you, you don't experience anything you experience just for you. It is for you, right? It is for you, but it ain't just for you. You're, you're there to learn something so that you can help somebody else somewhere else down the line. And as hard as that seems and as, as, as violent as that seems sometimes, because some of the things we endure are tough. It stinks. I get it, I know. But it ain't just for you. Listen, contentment is learned and it takes some personal experience. So these things that you're enduring, these things that you're going through, don't just throw your hands up and go, why me, God? Show me while I'm here, God. Teach me while I'm here, God. Because if you don't learn it the first time, guess what? It's a good chance you'll get to do it again. All this stuff Paul went through, as much as he suffered, he knew it was for Christ. He knew it was for the gospel. He knew it was for purpose. Listen, I, I want to go in just a little bit of detail on one of these stories for just a second. Just, this is a little bit of a rabbit, but I got, I got to. Y'all realize that he's on a ship. He's chained to a Roman guard. They're taking him to see Caesar. He's on a ship. The storm blows in. The ship starts falling apart. They're throwing stuff off the ship to keep it afloat long enough to get to shore. They crash into this um, island, which they crash before they actually get to the island because the Bible says they, they took, this is where surfing came from, they took parts of the boat and rode that in, on into the island. They were riding in planks. That's where surfing came from, Mac. I thought you invented it for a long time, then I read that. So they get on this island, everybody, nobody, can, nobody dies during this shipwreck. They can't believe it. Everybody survives. So they build a fire, they're sitting around this fire, and Paul, while he's gathering firewood, gets bit by a viper, a snake. Obviously the most deadly snake anybody's ever seen because the Bible says that those that were sitting there at that campfire was watching Paul expecting him to die. I mean, they've seen him get bit and they go, who cuz ain't going to make it. And they just kick back and start staring at him. And the longer they sit there, the more astonished they are. They're going, he ain't died. He ain't even sick. He ain't dead. What's going on? And they go, you are different from anybody else. You just got bit by the most deadly thing we've ever seen, and you ain't even sick. Do you think Paul wanted to be bit by a snake? Do you think Paul wishes God could have taught him what was taught through that some other way? I do. And so many times that's all we can see is the fact, God, you let me get bit not the impact it had on everybody else around. Paul's M.O. was the gospel. It didn't matter what it cost him, he was going to preach the gospel. You know what's the first thing he did when he got in front of Caesar? Preach the gospel. Everywhere he went, again, I don't tell you I believe Paul believed these things because he wrote them. I believe Paul believed these things because he lived them. When he talks about being able to be content, I can go back and look at the situations that Paul was in and goes, yeah, you know what? To him, Christ was enough. If he didn't have nothing but Christ, Paul was okay with that. And I think about myself and I go, so am I? Am I? I mean, I can say that, but can I point to things in my life where you can look at it from the outside and go, I believe him because... And if not, what adjustments can I make to get to that place? What can I do differently in my day-to-day -day life that I do become that example? 
where, where people can look at my life and look at my behavior and go, you know, if nothing else, old Nick was content. First of all, it's learned. It ain't born in you. You didn't wake up with it this morning. You got to learn how. It's going to come from personal experience. So don't look at these things that are going on crazy in your life and think it's just happenstance. It's there for a reason. It's learned. It's personal experience. Number three. Look at, uh, let's keep reading where we were because I, I think it's in verse 14 where I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> um, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret. You see that? You know what it means for something to be secret? It ain't common knowledge, is it? If you're going to find it, you're going to have to work to find it. Well, unless you give your secret to Montana and then you just stand around and it'll just... You have to be careful who you give your secrets to because, see, secret means that it's hidden. It's in a place where you have to look to find it. It's not common knowledge. It's not out in the open. So when Paul says that he learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need, he had to work at that, right? He had to search it out. It ain't just common knowledge. Look at this, number 13. If you don't think that people can take one verse out of context and make it say something that it don't really say, here is the number one example I go to. Look, hear what this says, verse 13. Now you've heard verse Philippians 4.13 by itself. It's been on t-shirts, it's been on bumper stickers, it's been everywhere. And it's been misused. Let's read it and just refresh our minds on what it says. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. A lot of times you'll see it, it'll say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it becomes our motto for winning ball games. It becomes our motto for winning races. It becomes our motto for I can do anything in this world. It ain't nothing I can't do through Christ. What is Paul talking about when he writes that verse? He's talking about suffering. <laughs> He's talking about being content. He ain't talking about conquering the world. He ain't talking about winning a ball game. Is he? He's talking about suffering. He's talking about, I have learned the secret to facing life with absolutely nothing or facing it with absolutely everything. No matter where I'm at, no matter my circumstances, I am content. Because his understanding is that the only way you can live a life content is to trust Christ in all you do and have your hope in Him, in Him alone, in everything you do. Not just in church, not just in certain horrible situations, but everyday life. And that's where that verse comes through. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he's talking about is suffering. What he's talking about is having the understanding that if all I have is Christ, that's enough. It doesn't mean that Christ is your genie in a bottle and if you rub on it enough, you get what you want. That's not what that verse means. It doesn't mean that I can go out here and as long as I proclaim to be a Christian, I can conquer anything. It doesn't mean that. We see Christians fail. We see Christians suffer. There is no promise of prosperity in the gospel. Therefore, there is no such thing as a prosperity gospel. It don't exist. There's nowhere you can find in this gospel that promises you if you become a Christian, you'll be rich if you have enough faith. It don't say that. As a matter of fact, Christ Himself, if you read in the four gospels and His own ministry, He spent most of His time telling people, this is going to cost you. You're going to suffer on account of this. At one point, he looks at the people following him and goes, are you sure you want to go? I mean, I don't even have a place to lay my head. 
are you sure you want to follow me? I mean, if you want to follow me, let the bed bury their own dead. In other words, I don't care that you need to go to your mama's funeral. That don't sound very like, much like a prosperity gospel to me. <laughs> it don't sound like a promise of if you have enough, and the danger in telling somebody if you have enough, enough faith, you'll be rich. When they wake up tomorrow and they're not rich, what do they do? Well, I evidently don't have enough faith. I'm not good enough for this. It's more important that you understand that what the gospel says is Christ is enough. It's more important that you understand that what Paul is saying when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what he's really saying is, if I don't have nothing in this world but Christ, I win either way. It's like a few weeks ago when Kevin was preaching on to live is Christ and to die is... Listen, if all this world can do to you is take your life away, Right? That's the, wor that's the worst thing that can happen to us in this world is die. In other words, if you go ask ungodly people or worldly people or unchurched people what's the worst thing that can happen, they go, not wake up tomorrow. So if the worst thing that can happen to us in this world is death, as a Christian, is that the worst thing that can happen to you? <laughs> so why would we have any fear of anything? And see, that lack of fear is what makes you content in some cases. I mean, the worst that can happen is I die. So to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's learned. It comes from personal experience. Look at verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. It was kind of you to share my trouble. Contentment comes when we learn how to share in the sufferings of those around us. To see what we are prone to do. If it's not at my house, you know, really is it that big a deal? In other words, we have a lack of compassion. We have a, individuals have a lack. In other words, if I have to step on you to get to my mower, I mean, I hate you as standing there, but I'm probably going to step on you, right? I mean, that's the mindset we have. Why? Because we're all about self-preservation. We have no compassion for other people. If Christ didn't have nothing else, he had compassion. I mean, think of it. He left the throne room of God. He left heaven as God experienced life on this earth for my sake. He had compassion. We lack compassion. We, we should learn to share in other people's troubles. What this does in, in, the, in the eyes of trying to learn contentment is we're telling self no. Because naturally to us, it's self-preservation. We make decisions based on what's best for me and mine. We don't make decisions based on what's best for others. So my contentment stops where you take away from me, where I'm not gaining more, right? So in order to be content, I've got to share in other people's troubles. I've got to have compassion for those around me. The Philippians had compassion for Paul. They shared in his troubles. When he suffered, they suffered. When he cried, they cried. The good news of that is when he laughed, they laughed. When he flourished, they flourished. When he celebrated, they celebrated. It's tied together, and we're okay with celebrating with somebody who's celebrating. We just don't want to sign up for no extra suffering. Hey, I do enough suffering for me. I don't want to have to suffer for you too, right? It's our mentality. 
That's why I'm telling you this is not natural to you. It is learned behavior. You, you didn't wake up with it. You weren't born with it. It's not natural to you. We are selfish. Every one of us at our core, our number one problem is we are selfish. We care about me more than we care about anything else. And you are born into that. And if you don't believe that, watch your children as they grow. Why do you want that? Because he has it. <laughs> Why are you crying? Because I want that. We're selfish. We want what we want when we want it. And listen, people have gotten rich off of your selfishness. Huh? We live in a fast food, drive through, microwave society. If you can promise me convenience in a timely manner, I'll pay whatever you want. If I can pull up to that first speaker and tell them what I want, pull up to that first window, give them my money, pull up to that third window and get my food, and all that take less than about three to five minutes, happy camper, I'll be back tomorrow. Why? Because I want what I want when I want it. It's rooted in my selfishness. People have become millionaires in this country because you and I are selfish. We'd rather get it out of the microwave in five minutes than wait on the crock pot to cook it for 12, 14 hours. And let me tell you, what comes out of that crock pot? A whole lot better than what comes out of that microwave. But that means you might have to do some dishes, huh? Right? I might have to clean up. We won't do that. That takes away from my time where I do my thing. that's so important we're going to have the biggest thumbs of any generation ever <laughs> talked to a dad yesterday he said oh I won't call his name did your boy, did your boy get him a deer he said no he could have I said he could have he said yeah he had his phone in his apps <laughs> I had his, had his head in his apps Because that's what we do. Right? And you know what? If they come out with a new one tomorrow, we'll go sleep in the street to get the latest and greatest. People are making a killing over our selfishness. They're getting rich over our selfishness. And look, y'all can say what you want to. Every one of you look at me and go, I, only, I could go without my phone. No, you couldn't. If you left coming to church this morning without your phone, you can go back and get it. One exception. Majority still rules. Right, right. It's learned behavior. It comes from life's experience. <clears throat> you have to to share in the sufferings of others. And number four. In verse 15, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift. Listen, bear with me. The gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Listen to verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours. Remember this is all one letter, this is all one this is all one statement. Go back up to verse 17, not that I seek the gift but I seek the fruit of the increase of your credit. Listen to verse 18. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. 
Where do you think Paul is, is crediting the fact that he is well supplied, that he has received full payment? He tells us in verse 19, and my God, look at that. The verse starts with and, tying it back to something that's already said. In other words, Paul's going, I don't need for nothing. My every need is supplied. And my God who supplied my need will supply your every need. In order to be content, you're going to have to learn to trust the sovereignty of God. You're going to have to learn to be able to believe that whatever I need, God will supply. Somehow, some way. I could give you instance upon instance upon instance upon instance of that occurring, and I am a witness to it. I have seen it happen. I, I, the most memorable time that it happened, the one that always comes to my mind, is that our fish day, one of the first fish days we had, and we underestimated our crowd. See, we was counting how many kids was going to come fishing. We didn't count how many grandpas, aunts, uncles, grandmas, brothers, sisters, and cousins they'd bring because we was going to have a hot dog and a hamburger. So we very well underestimated. And I, don't, I can't ever remember the exact numbers, but I can tell you this. We had enough food to feed right at 100 people. Right, right at. I, we, I used to know exactly how many patties we ordered and how many dogs we ordered. We was right at 100 people. We got to counting heads when it came food time. And they come over there to me and Kirby where we was at and they said, we're going to run out of food. Whoa, we're going to what? We, ain't, we can't feed all these people. Why? We've counted 150. We know we've got food for 100. What are we going to do, Kirby? You know what Kirby said? He said, we're going to go over here. We're going to put the lid on the food. We had the hot dogs in a styrofoam cooler. We had the hamburgers in a styrofoam cooler. We're going to put the lids on, and we're going to pray over them. And we're going to say, God, we, don't know, we know what's in here, and we know what's out there, and the math ain't in our favor. God, please don't. Please feed these people. And it was what we did. And you can call me a liar if you want to, but I've got at least two witnesses. Kirby sitting right back there and Amanda sitting right there. I promise you this is a real story. We counted over 50 people that was more there than we had planned on. Big Daddy cooked, that's right. He cooked, he running the grill that day. Me and Kirby were standing up there watching people come by with two hot dogs and two hamburgers. And that one big guy with two hamburgers and a hot dog. <laughs> uh, and I'm over there going, I don't know, Kirby. He said, don't worry about it, Slick. Don't worry about it. I said, come on, Kirby. I mean, this, I mean, this is simple math, dude. He said, don't worry about it. Don't say a word. Don't worry about it. We had hot dogs and hamburgers left over. Wow. And I, I promise you that's a true story. I promise you. That's the sovereignty of God. All, all we could do, we knew the math don't add up. All we could do was trust God. Now, I'm not telling you at your next party, your next event, to just buy a few and pray over it. I ain't saying that at all. We never did that again, did we, Kirby? We never tried. To, we didn't test him. We didn't try that no more, so I ain't telling you to do it on purpose. But I'm telling you, when you find yourself, whatever that situation is, in order for you to live a life of contentment, you've got to learn to trust the sovereignty of God. He knows more than you know. He's far and above capable of doing more than you can imagine. But you've got to trust Him to do it. It had been real easy for us to panic and Kirby said, well, all I know to do is send somebody to go get some more hot dogs. But we didn't. You just got to trust Him. And man, it's, I ain't going to lie to you, it's hard sometimes. Because, see, we know too much about our situation. And we look at God and go, you must not understand. And he's going, oh, I understand. Just trust me. Just trust me. You've got to learn to trust the sovereignty of God. Listen, I, 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 this, this is a very important subject for us as Christians. At some point, we're going to have to learn to be content 
no matter what the situation is. Because there may be coming a time where you being a Christian costs you. See, in America, we don't know what that means. To this point, we don't know what it means on a large scale to suffer for Christ. Rarely do we understand what it means to suffer for Christ. None of us came to church this morning in fear that somebody would snipe us if they figured out we were going to a church service. We didn't come in here this morning hiding our Bibles because we thought if somebody seen our Bible, they would take our life. In general, in large capacity, we don't as Americans understand what it means to suffer for Christ. I ain't saying we ain't suffered at all. I'm not saying that at all. But on large scale, we don't understand it. I'm afraid we're going to understand it. <laughs> if, if something don't change really rapidly and God don't do something really drastically, I'm afraid that contentment's going to be very important to us as Americans. That we're going to have to say, I'm going to stand on the gospel and whatever it costs me, it just costs me. And if I have to live out in the shed or out in the woods and have to figure out which bugs are safe to eat and which ones ain't, then that's just what I'll have to do. And you know, you cringe at that, but what about John? Honey and locust? It's not impossible, guys. In our minds, it's hard to conceive because of the grace that we've experienced. But the reality of it is, it's possible that Christianity could really cost you something. So where do you draw the line? Do you just say, Christ is enough, whatever it costs me, that's fine? Or do you have a place where you go, well, I won't go no further than this? Because <laughs> most of us have that line. As long as it's just me, I'm good. As long as it's just me and my wife, I'm okay. What if it costs me my child? Am I still a Christian? What if it costs me my family? Am I still a Christian? You do know that people in the Bible lost their family, lost their children for no reason other than they followed Christ. You realize that, right? That's real. So is Christ enough? Can you be content? I mean, we panic if our phone's over and two or three years old. If our, if, I mean, if our vehicle's a 98, nearing 400,000 miles. Wow. I know y'all think that ain't possible, but I got one. Right? Right? Can you really be content? It's not natural to you. It's learned. It's going to take some adjustments, right? I think we ought to take this very serious. I think we ought to listen to what Paul has to say and learn the secret of contentment. It ain't just going to come to you. <clears throat> You're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to experience some things. You're going to have to accept some things. Yeah, I know it's scary. It's scary to sit and think that my Christianity could cost me things. And when you start listing those things, and you know what? I had a science teacher in the eighth grade that taught me something. He taught me a bunch of stuff. But he taught me one thing that really stuck with me. Bad things always happen to somebody else. Bad things always happen to somebody else. You know why you don't wear your seatbelt? It ain't going to happen to you. You know why you don't mind going without insurance? It ain't going to happen to you. You know why you don't keep a gun on the nightstand? It ain't going to happen to you. So it'd be easy for me to say after saying all this today to look at you and go, and you know what? I may be wrong. And you know what would happen? Your mind would latch onto it and you'd go, yeah, because bad things always happen to somebody else. 
I ain't going to worry about contentment and I'm going to stroll on like I'm going. And guess what? When it does happen, now you're trying to make all these difficult decisions in the midst of all the chaos. Hey, y'all, we ain't good at making decisions at all, ever. You certainly don't want to do it in the month of chaos. It's time to decide. <clears throat> Is Christ enough? Is he really enough? Dale, Savannah, they're going to come up here and lead us in a song or two. I'm going to ask you to just to just clear your mind and, and just think about what we've talked about this morning. Think about what you've read in the scriptures this morning. I want you to remove my opinions and my stories and all that stuff, and I just want you to think about what the Bible says on this subject. Just the things that we read this morning. And listen, I didn't take you all over the Bible. I didn't get you flipping a bunch of places. I kept you right there in Philippians chapter 4, and you can read that over and over again, and I promise you it'll say the same thing every time you read it. Think about it. Is contentment on your list of things to achieve? If not, you need to get it there to learn how to live content with any situation, trust in the sovereignty of God, sharing in the sufferings of others. Listen, when they strip everything else away from the church, what else do we have except each other? I, had a, I was going to do a video on my phone and save this for some time. You know the Bible says iron sharpens iron, right? And what he's talking about is Christians need Christians. That's how we grow. It's how we get sharp, how we stay sharp. Guy brought a bulldozer in last week. Me and Dillard pulled the undercarry got from under it, <clears throat> putting uh, sprocket segments on it. And I, and I wanted the video and I wanted the picture so I could make y'all understand you could get this visualization. If you can understand a bicycle chain, y'all know what a bicycle chain is, right? It's got teeth. On a wheel up here, it's got your pedals on it, and it's got teeth on a gear back here that's connected to your wheel, and that's what makes it turn is you put pressure one on the other, right? You know that design of that chain? It's got that round roller that sits down in a tooth. It's the way a bulldozer works. It has what they call a chain, and it's got pads on that chain. That's the big tracks you see. That chain works the same way as a bicycle except for it's motor-driven. Back here on the back, it's got a sprocket with them segments on it, and those rollers set down inside of that. When you put power to this, it pulls this. Makes that chain pull. That's what pushes you forward and backward. That's all metal or iron. When those are new, those sprocket segments at the top of that tooth is about that wide. Over time, with metal rubbing on metal or iron on iron that piece that tooth wears out when it's wore out it becomes like a razor blade literally we were taking it apart the other day and all not not laying on it not pushing on it not falling on it dillard laid his arm on that sprocket segment to take bolts out and it sli i mean it sliced he picked his arm didn't even know he was cut he went on to the next boat, and I said, Cuz, you about cut your stinking arm off. And he did this, and it opened up, and I mean, it's just. I took a rag and laid on that tooth and pulled it down, and it just split it like you was laying it on a razor blade. And the first thing that come to my mind is iron sharpens iron. It takes time. That thing didn't wear out overnight. It didn't get in that situation in just a few months. I've had somebody come and ask me before, is it true that iron sharpens iron? And I tell them, it is possible. And I didn't think of it this way at the time when I answered the question because my mind, when I think about that, goes back to us sharpening pocket knives, sharpening blades, a steel blade. Well, there are materials that do a better job at sharpening than other materials. Today, the most popular thing, most effective thing, the most efficient thing is diamond you buy a diamond stone 
and you rub that metal blade on that diamond stone and it'll, it'll cut away the metal and put an edge on. The reason God uses the example of iron sharpening iron in my mind now, it's not a hurry up process. It takes time. We need one another. If we're going to live a life of contentment, you need other Christians. And if for no other reason, because iron sharpens iron. And that don't happen in one hour on Sunday morning once a week. Ain't going to work. It, it, by the time you're sharp, you'll be dead. You'll run out of time. 